Hello again, everybody. This is Joe Larson, and welcome back to the 505 on Racing Show. We had a couple of week hiatus there, but uh, we're back in the saddle this week. Uh, some things to talk about, stuff that happened and went on in New Hampshire. The uh, NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour, Ryan Priest. And I want to start off this show with uh, a belated happy birthday to the king, Richard Petty. Uh, we had a whole big thing planned out for the the July 3rd show, I believe it was, and unfortunately we, we were unable to uh, air that, that night. But Richard Petty, not only is Richard Petty known as the king of stock car auto racing, Richard Petty is probably uh, my favorite, I'm not gonna say maybe probably is the wrong word, he is my favorite NASCAR person. Now as an owner, I, I grew up watching Richard Petty tear up every track he went to, and, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Richard Petty went out there, he had awesome equipment, second generation driver, uh, son of Lee Petty. And, and, and I can remember Richard Petty, and, and, and this is going back to 1967, I was only like nine years old, coming to Isop Speedway here on Long Island. Now Richard Petty in 1967 won 27 races. Imagine that, 27 races. Now they didn't have the schedule that the top series has now. They didn't have the 36-week schedule, and you know, and the last ten are for a chase or a playoff, as they call it. They raced just about every week, and Daytona wasn't the first race of the year. They started out west, Riverside, California, out there, and they worked their way back. And they didn't have corporate jets. They didn't have big shops and a whole mess of guys and gals working in there building cars. They took the car they had, they loaded it on the trail, and they went. And if something broke, they fixed it there. On the way there, back at the hotel, that morning at the racetrack, they put it back together. And, and I remember Bobby Allison coming to Ice of Speedway here on Long Island. I remember him showing up with a beat up old car. When I say it was a beat up old car, I, I equated it to what was known then as the bombers that ran at Freeport uh, Stadium and Riverhead Raceway. It looked like a bomber car. It looked like a demolition derby car. The car was all tore up. And uh, he went to the local junkyard, put it back together. And although it wasn't painted all nice and shiny, he, he made the race. But you know, you're going back to Richard Petty, 80 years old. God bless him. Richard Petty, the, the, uh, the father of Kyle Petty and grandson of the late Adam Petty, um, and runs Richard Petty Motorsports now with Eric Amarola back in the wheel after his uh, back injury. But you know, I, you look back on Richard Petty, and how did he win so many races, 200 races in his career, with the last one coming at Daytona in front of uh, the, the then late President Ronald Reagan. And when, when you look back at Richard Petty, you look back in the 60s, that era of the 60s, early 70s, racing was different. There weren't a lot of corporate sponsors, you go back and look at pictures from those days, and you'll, you'll see somebody's car dealership on the car. Uh, you'll see somebody's gas station on the car. You'll see some guy's garage. Yeah, there, there wasn't corporate sponsorship. And all of a sudden, Richie shows, Richard Petty shows up with STP. STP, here it is. And Richard Petty always ran that blue color, him and his dad with the exception of his dad, had white cars early on, but for the most part, they had blue cars. And it was, it was a special blue paint that, it was an equal mix of white and blue, because at the time when they were painting these cars, that's all they had. They weren't running down to the, to the paint store and buying more paint and taking it to the spray booth. They put it in their garage, they used what they had. And the petty blue became synonymous with the 43. Now, STP comes into, 
into play with Andy Granatelli, who was president of STP and, and Motorsports Marketing at the time, has Richard Petty, and of course they want the car red. Well, they compromised. So they called it Granatelli Red, Petty Blue, and the rest was history. Now, looking back on it, they had more money than probably the rest of the teams put together. So of course they had the best of everything. Of course they had extra motors, extra cars, people on the payroll all of a sudden. And Richard Petty just was the dominating factor of his era. And you, know, you look back on that, nobody's ever really dominated the sport the way he has. You know, some people say, what about Jeff Gordon? when he was in his heyday, Jimmy Johnson with his seven championships tie in the King and the late Dale Earnhardt. But they didn't dominate the sport the way Richard Petty did. Richard Petty was a, a win at all cost guy and he had the money and the manpower to do it. A family run operation, it's still a family run operation for the most part. Uh, a lot of Petty's are <laughs> employed at Richard Petty Motorsports, even though they've partnered up with other people. But 80 years old, 80 years old, and still looking good, still looks fit, still has all his wits about him. Uh, I had the opportunity, uh, I guess it was about a year ago in Dover, to kind of interact with him. There was a, <laughs> a spare rear beating contest. And, um, I didn't enter because I didn't know, I thought you had to eat like a, a million spare ribs. I didn't know it was a time thing. But uh, he was there, he interacted with the fans. Another time in Martinsville, it was early, early in the morning and we sat down and chatted. And later on in the afternoon, the garage was hot, so it wasn't, there weren't a lot of people and sitting behind Richard Petty's hall or having lunch, believe it or not, and a bologna sandwich and, and a soft drink. And you're looking at the other teams that have these big barbecues. <laughs> they got to cook, a special guy cooking filet mignons. But no, Richard Petty, keep it, keeping it simple. So again, a belated birthday to Richard Petty. And uh, you know, no, no matter who's in that number 43, I'll be rooting for them, um, no matter who it is, no matter who it is. And, and just watching that car drive, it's like watching history when you see the 43. That's the number hasn't changed the shape of the numbers, the colors of the numbers, you know, his, his color schemes, very little variation over the last, I'm going to say almost 60 years from 1959 to the present, you know, and, and I still take pride in, in the 43 car. Yeah, we're not getting the finishes that we were accustomed to getting <laughs> back in the 60s and the early 70s. But it's still you know, something you, you, you look back on and root for. So, uh, again, happy birthday to Richard Petty. And uh, hope to see him around for many more. Now, speaking of Richard Petty Motorsports, Eric Almarola returned to the 43 car at New Hampshire this, this past weekend, finishing uh, 24th. Uh, not a great run, but not a bad run either. In fact, he was the uh, last car on the lead lap. So to stay on the lead lap in a one-mile racetrack going 301 laps, I, I think is an accomplishment to a guy that just got cleared, I believe that Friday, uh, by the NASCAR doctors. And when he did that, I mean, let's put it this, this is what he does for a living. And if, if he had a job where he can collect comp or collect disability, I'm sure he wouldn't have been back. But uh, Eric Amarola is a tough competitor. And it was great to see him back in the seat, back in the seat, making it happen. And uh, he'll be in Indy next week. And uh, I'm, I'm looking for a little bit better of a run uh, for Eric Amarola. Uh, some news there, too, in, a, in that level. A 21-year-old Chase Elliott signed an extension with Hendrick Motorsports through 2022. Elliott was the 2016 uh, Cup Rookie of the Year, and uh, Hendrick Motorsports was following this kid when he was 15 years old. And I know uh, when I worked some of the k and Pro Series East West uh, East races in NASCAR, um, Chase Elliott was a competitor there, and and so was Ryan Blaney. It was kind of interesting 
watching Chase Elliott and Ryan Blaney racing while their the dads, Richard Petty, um, Richard Petty, wow, um, Bill Elliott, I got Richard Petty on the mind, Bill Elliott and Dave Blaney on the sidelines watching. I remember I went up to Dave Blaney and I was like, what's it like watching a kid race at this level? And he goes, uh, it's a little nerve wracking because I didn't get this nervous when I was racing. So, but they've grown up and, and the people joke around that the K&N Pro Series East and West is, really stands for kids and nephews and not K&N filters, but it's what it appears. And, and the big boys are using that as their minor league, so to speak. And uh, a lot of guys are coming out of that series. And back when it was the old Bush North series, when we had the, we had the, uh, the Sprint Cup series, and we had the, actually it was the Nextel Cup series and the Bush series um, as the top two, you know, but corporate, corporate names are starting to get into it. We're going to talk about that later on in the, in the show, about what corporate America is doing in NASCAR. But when you, you look at these kids that are coming up, they're, they're scouting these kids when they're racing go-karts, Bondoleros, legend cars, and that's when they're starting to look at these kids, and then they start grooming them to find them a marriage with sponsors. You know, it used to be if you could get the cars around, you had to ride, we'll find a sponsor later. And what's happening now is you need to come to the table with money. And not only in the top three series, but in the, in the touring series as well. I, I was talking to one car owner who, in the NASCAR Whaler Modified Tour who, who shall remain nameless, um, and he was looking for a driver. Now there's a lot of guys walking around there that, that are capable chauffeurs. And I said to the guy, he says, what about so-and-so? He goes, yeah, you'd be good. I says, well, why don't we set up a meeting? Why don't you have somebody talk to him? Because I did. I said, yeah, how'd that go? He didn't want it? Oh, he wants it. I said, I don't understand. I'm confused. He said, you want to drive my race car, you got to come to the table with something, either a couple of motors or a tire bill. Now, just quickly off the top of my head, a couple of motors is around 100,000 competitive motors in that series, and 10 tires a week at like $180 a tire, that's 1,800 times the 15 races. So, <laughs> you know, do the math. You need to come to the table at $100,000. And, and who knows how long that's gonna last. You know, but years ago, if somebody was good, they made it happen. They made it happen and it was all good. And it's a whole different, whole different era now with, with these young drivers and, and I know, and I look back, I look back at, you know, you're able to follow your guy and follow, hey, this guy was in a weekly series, now he's in a touring series. Hey, they didn't have a truck series back then, but hey, now he's in the, the Bush series or the Bush North. And, and, you know, he might be able to get a, get a, you know, a ride in a cup car back then. And that was like, whoa, you know, Stephen Park, cut his teeth, Long Island, Isa Speedway, Riverhead Raceway, tour, touring modified. And then uh, got the call, and um, you know he was in the show, so to speak. So you know those days are over. Now, Stephen Park didn't show up with a boatload of money when he was driving for DEI, you know. But Dale Earnhardt was the late Dale Earnhardt. He was old school. I have a talented guy. Let's get him in a car. Let's go get a sponsor. And it was all good. Anyway. We're going to take a break and we come back. We're going to talk about the NASCAR wheel and modified race that went on at New Hampshire uh, this past weekend when we come back. Hey, hey what's up? Oh, I said was going to say what's up for some reason. Hey, hey we're set it up and you're watching the Radio TV Network.
Village Music Shop of Mastic. 1-800-HEY-DUDE, your full service store with personalized attention, school band instrument rentals and sales, music instruction on all instruments for all styles and age groups, for guitars, drums, amplifiers, PA systems and accessories. It's Village Music Shop, 1495 Montauk Highway in Mastic. Call 1-800-HEY-DUDE or go to villagemusicshop.com. Hi there, this is Buddy from Less Than Jake, and you are listening to In Radio TV. You're probably watching it, too. Hey, welcome back. Hey, before we start talking about the Modifieds, uh, a little quick note. Uh, uh, Long Island champion race car driver Cookie Visconti is in the, uh, in the hospital here on Long Island. Um, the last time, or last few times I saw him here on Long Island racing um, as part of his uh, son John's uh, crew, uh, Cookie was on a scooter, having trouble getting around. In fact, uh, opening day or practice day, I had seen him, he, he didn't leave the trailer. He just stayed there and he said his hip was bothered. Well, uh, Cookie had uh, hip replacement surgery. So uh, get, will, get well rich wishes go out to Cookie uh, as he recovers from hip surgery. When, when a guy who's not 70 um, has a surgery like that, the recovery is a little bit longer than if a, a younger person who might not be 60 has the same surgery. So uh, our prayers go out to, to Cookie on a speedy recovery. And uh, those of us that are here at in Ravio and Ultimate Media as part of the 505 on Racing Show uh, wish him well. So anyway, the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour was at the New Hampshire Motor Speedway this past weekend. And uh, Bobby Santos was uh, the winner there. And I think we have those results. Ryan Priest was second from the pole. Dave Sapienza from Long Island was third. Brendan Bach fourth. Chase Dowling fifth. And the size sixth. Ted Christopher was seventh, the winningest modified driver at New Hampshire with five wins. Max Zeckham was eighth. Rowan Pennick was ninth. And Sean Solomino rounding out the top ten. Uh, Timmy Solomino, the, the natural, was in a horrific wreck and uh, walked away kind of after being treated at the infield care center. And, and Timmy's first words were, I'm okay, and I want to thank NASCAR for the safety features that they've made us get and have on our race cars. Um, they say, if you watch this wreck, you wonder how he even got, got away unscathed. But uh, hey, you know, NASCAR could be real buster sometimes on some of this stuff. I can remember as a tech inspector going around and guys, you know, want to argue with me when I say fix this, change that, do this, don't do that. And, uh, you know, here he goes, he has a crash and he walks away. And, you know, and share a little story about uh, one of my first times that I'm going to say maybe it was my third or second year. Um, they needed me because we were shorthanded, of course, to uh, do inspections on cars. The it was. They don't do it the way they do it now back then, but basically we, we went around the cars, we, we checked certain things, and uh, one of the teams had a fuel cell that, in my opinion, was mounted incorrectly. Now, I was kind of new at this tech stuff, and my modified experience was little to none, even though I was race director prior to that. Um, you're working from the tower, you, you have good people under you, you're good. But here we are at New Hampshire, all the big dogs in NASCAR are there, from the, the president of NASCAR, managing directors of NASCAR, competition directors. I had to be on my toes. So I took a look at this, this car, and it wasn't a regular per se, the driver was, but the owner was, you know, he comes to some shows, and I'm looking at this fuel cell, and I'm not liking it. So I didn't pass the car. Well, of course, the car owner goes and gets the, the technical, uh, head technical guy at NASCAR, uh, whose name shall be remain nameless. Uh, this is well, way back. And he's going to come look at it with me. 
So it kind of looks at me when I'm, I show them what my concerns were, and we're looking at it. We're, we're looking at it and looking at it, and it just wasn't right. It just wasn't right, in my opinion. Well, I get overruled. Well, guess what? Lo and behold, that car backs into the first turn wall and explodes. It explodes. There's fire on the racetrack. The car gets a go. Thank goodness that the safety crews were out there and they extinguished the fire. But the car explodes. Okay. I'm sitting there and I'm like, just shaking my head. So the race ends. I'm up in the tower. The race ends and I get a call from 26 on the radio. 26 to tower. Go ahead, 26. Now, for those who don't know, I think I might have mentioned this. At that level, you don't use names. Everybody has a number, and 26 is Mike Helton. Mike Helton says, on your way down, stop at the, stop at the big house. I'm away. I'm away, 26. So I walk in. Ed Cox, our series director, is already there, and our head technical inspector comes with me. We sit down and he has the inspection sheet in his hand from that car. Joe, you okay this fuso? I said, well, let me explain. He's not explain. You okay this fuso? Now I don't want to throw my buddy under the bus here. So I said, well, well I did, but I had help. Oh man head technical that guy said he didn't want that to pass. I told him it was okay, let it go. The mounting enough you so. So with that, I'm told to leave. Of course I stay outside and I'm trying to listen and got a little loud, but when it was all said and done, everybody shook hands and walked away. When you're doing a technical inspection on a race car, whether it's the chassis height, bumper heights, where the headers are, where the padding is, the dates on the, the fuel cell, window net, seat belts, shift to boot, it's all gotta be right. And these cars are now, for all of that stuff, are checked every week. And you know, I look back on, and you're talking 15 years ago, how we tech the cars then and how we tech them now is totally different. And, and I always wondered why we did one inspection of the cars overall for everything intense at open at night or the first event. And then we only checked certain things throughout the season back then. You know, now it's, you know, it's insane what they check out. And, and, but it's a good insane. And you know, if a guy's window net expired like last week, we saw this one. You got a next race, have it fixed. Now today, and, and it's a good thing. And, and there, were, there were guys playing with the SFI stickers. I know that there was a guy who, who cut an SFI sticker off one of the fire suits he had that didn't fit, and he kind of glued it onto his noose. I knew he, I knew he did it, you know, but I couldn't prove it. So what are you gonna do? But uh, you know, as Timmy Solomon says, thank goodness NASCAR's safety is good. This he, he thanked everybody. You know, Troy for building a safe race car, Joya seating for the seat. You know, I I'm, I'm surprised he didn't, you know, thank U.S. Steel for making good steel. But you know, and 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 I almost you know I, you know I don't want to make a joke out of it, but it's 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 good. It's good that they do that. It's really good that they do that. You know, and and speaking of the modifiers, I'll tell you what I was looking at some pictures of, of the race and the people posting. And I was a little surprised by the attendance that I saw in the grandstands. Now this is one of the, when I say most exciting races of the weekend, it, it is. And you have, you know, cup guys who could stay in their haulers or go back to the hotel, watch this event. And they're not looking for the next Richard Petty. It's an exciting race. Ryan Newman was in it. And when you, when you look at that, um, when, when you, you look at that race, it's like, wow, you know. And they got, a, they got this restrictor plate on them to slow them down, and they're still almost as fast as the cup cars. They're still almost as fast. And, you know, 
It's a safety thing, and it's 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 the showcase of racetrack. They go back in September, and uh, you know New Hampshire. I I watched in car cameras, um, you know from from the event, and just to listen to what it sounds like, and they is even though you got those big tires sticking out in front, and and nothing direct in the the wind, other than the, the roof, you know and. And they draft, and and you, they go fast. Uh, it was Ryan Newman says, I can go in deeper than you guys because I'm going into this corner at the same speed with half the amount of tire that you guys have. And when you, when you look at that, you know he's right. He's right. So he, he knows how deep he can take the cup car in. So he's going to take the modified car a little bit deeper. But you know anyway, you know, go into the safety of of the modifieds. You know, th there's a lot of wiggle room on certain things, but when it comes to safety, you don't want to play those games. You don't want to play games with, with safety. You know, do I think sometimes NASCAR gets a little ridiculous of what they're looking at? I, yeah, they, they, they do. You know, and, and one of the things that we did years ago that we, they don't do now is, you know, when you're doing that tech stuff, especially for a, a guy who's running the bottom third of the pack, who's gonna be couple, two, three, four, five laps down. And you, know, you, you check wheelbase, and for those who don't know the wheelbase rule is, uh, I if I can remember correctly, it's uh, 82 to 85 with a one inch, one inch variance, left side, right side. So, so you have a guy who's like, you know, he's at 85, but the other side is at 85 and an eighth. The guy's gonna finish 20th. Let it go. Don't break the guy's chops. You know, it's not a competitive issue, and it's not a safety issue. You know, yeah, if his bumper wasn't mounted correctly, hey, you know what? Go fix this. Nerf bars aren't right. Yup, take care of this. Firewall has a big hole in it. You can't race with that. But something like a wheelbase that's on a non-competitive car, I, I think that's a little bit overkill. Yeah, do you have to draw the line somewhere? Absolutely. Yeah, does the rule state this? Sure it does. But sometimes common sense has to kick in. And, and it's, you know, the other thing, and I don't understand, and it, and it happened to, uh, and the couple we're gonna talk about that later, but, you know, guy goes through, the, through this crazy tech in the Cup Series. When I say crazy, that it's taken so long that some guys are missing practice. It shouldn't take that long. It shouldn't. So the guy gets through. Everything's perfect. They put down the, the, the laser thing comes down. The thing that goes all over the body comes down. They measure everything with the little field gauges. And you know, it's all good. Now the guy goes out. So that's fast time. Oh, wait. We're going to check your car again. Oh, wait. Your trunk deck is no good. It's off by, I don't know, 130 seconds. Are you kidding me? You're kidding, right? You know, even at the local tracks. I watched the guy go to time trials, go through the thing, wheel, ride heights, this, that, and the other thing, measure the frame heights, good to go, go out there. Race is over, goes under the, over the scales again, uh, you're an eighth of an inch too low. Now, you just ran, I don't know, 100 laps, 75 laps, whatever it was. You don't think that you're, your tires wore a little bit, that there's that eighth of an inch. You made it going out there. You went right from the scales to the impound area. So it's not like you played games. Could a spring have gotten soft? Absolutely. There's so many things. So you're going to deke, you you know, shame on you, Mr. Official, for not catching it before it went out. That's all I'm saying. You know, it's, it's not right. It's just not right. And when, when, you, 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 when I see things like that happen, I often I go like this, I go, politics, politics. You know, certain guys go out there, you know, they're not, they're human beings, these crew chiefs and fabricators and race teams, they're human beings. Why is it certain teams never, ever, ever have a discrepancy in tech post-race or pre-race? But certain teams, Bam. And I, you know, I'm going to share a little story. Jimmy Spencer, when he was racing in the Cup Series, 
they always nailed them for speed and on pit road. Now, I worked the Cup Series, and my job in, in a couple of races at some of the bigger tracks was manually with stopwatches keep track of two cars. I'd have to say when they're coming in, all right, I got the, the 23 and the 18. All right, and somebody else, I got... And the lines, not the pit boxes themselves, but the lines across pit road, depending on what pit road speed is, you could go like between the first line and then not the second one, but the third one, like 5.3 seconds. So if you did it in five seconds, you would, you know, you were penalized. So here's, here's Jimmy Spencer. He's getting penalized race after race. So he makes a deal with the TV people. They're going to put an in-car camera over his right shoulder so you could see it's him pointed at the tack. So what happens? When they're doing their four laps, they call them hot laps, warm-up laps, whatever you want to do, and, and then the caution car turns on its lights. That means he's at pit road speed. They hear the spotter say, lights are on, pit road speed. They looked at Jimmy Spence's tack, whatever it was, 3,500, I don't, I don't remember. So now you got him at 3,500. First pit stop, it comes in, the camera's on it. He's at 3,200, which is slower, in the same gear, because you can see the shift. He leaves the pits, 3,200. Boom, it's all good. Jerry Spencer got passed through or stop and go, speeding up hit road. <laughs> he went to NASCAR with the, the footage. And yeah, they didn't get him for speed anymore, but they got him on other things. He was outspoken, he was boisterous and they're gonna get him. We come back, we're gonna talk about the Xfinity race and some things going on in that series while we come back. Hi, I'm Remington. I'm Emerson. And I'm Sebastian. We're Palais Royale and you're watching in Radio TV. The world of advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, Inravio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is Inravio.com. Hey, this is Chris Lester Jake, and if Inravio.com spots you at an event wearing this bracelet, they will give you $100. Village Music Shop of Master, 1-800-HEY-DUDE, your full-service store with personalized attention, school band instrument rentals and sales, music instruction on all instruments for all styles and age groups, for guitars, drums, amplifiers, PA systems, and accessories, it's Village Music Shop. 1495 Montauk Highway in Mastic. Call 1 800 Hey Dude or go to villagemusicshop.com. Hi, this is Mike Jarecki from My Race News, and you're watching the Inravio TV Network. Hey, welcome back. Camp of World Truck Series was off this weekend. They will be in Eldora Speedway in Ohio, track owned by Tony Stewart. This Wednesday night, uh, Trucks on Dirt. And I'll tell you, that's, that's a nice place. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would love to see Sprint Cup cars. Ooh, man. Monster Energy Cup cars <laughs> on the dirt like they were back in the day. Wow, I still haven't slipped like that in a long time. But anyway. That's uh, so good. The Xfinity Series, yes, they were at New Hampshire this weekend. Kyle Busch was the winner there, followed by Ryan Priest, NASCAR Wheeler Modified Tour competitor. Uh, William Byron was third. Kyle Larson, fourth. Brad Keselowski was fifth. Ben Kennedy, sixth. Elliot Sadler, seventh. Ty Dillon, eighth. Cole Custer, ninth. And rounding out the top ten running pool. Nice race. It was good. And... And Ryan Priest, we're going to talk about Ryan Priest. Ryan Priest, a modified guy, 
he had some opportunities in the Nationwide Series uh, when it was Nationwide and had like a race or two last year. But uh, Joe Gibbs Racing um, gave an opportunity with Ryan finishing second at New Hampshire. Um, listening to his TV interview, he dedicated the win to all short track drivers out there. He's a short track guy. Trying to say, hey, there's still a shot. Young kid, you know, Priest, uh, I remember when he came on board in an NASCAR wheel and modified to him. And, and young kid, still had a lot to learn, but he could drive a race car. And uh, we interviewed him for our show at the Turkey Derby a couple of years ago. And that's all he talked about was getting to this level, the x level. He could drive a race car. He'll be good. His next, he's going to go out to Iowa where he's raced out there twice. But you know what these guys do today, which they couldn't do years ago, is they could go in a simulator. And, and I've seen a racing simulator. And when I, when I tell you, you, it's like you are on that racetrack, at that track down to the rust stains coming from the fence onto the wall. He's going to spend some time in the simulator getting himself ready for Iowa. Uh, and I know in the uh, Kane and Pro Series one out there, I, I'm not sure if, he, if those were the two events he ran, but he was, he was in Iowa twice and uh, 22 figure eight. Uh, he probably still calls them Winston Cup cars as he's been Winston Cup. They were Grand National cars. It took me years to stop calling them Grand National cars when Winston Cup took over. And then it was Nextel. Then it was, I mean, you know, and we're going to talk about that kind of stuff at the end. But anyway, uh, Priest was the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour champion in 2013. And with three runner up finishes in the championship, he's got 11 wins in the modifieds and. Uh, one on the Southern Modified Tour. He has three NASCAR All-American Series championships at two different tracks. Uh, Ryan Priest, I'll tell you what, Ryan Priest uh, drives a Modified for Long Island uh, Raceway, Riverhead Raceway, uh, Eddie and Connie Parchers. He drives uh, Modified for them, and, and speaking with Eddie, Eddie said, as long as Ryan Priest wants to drive a Modified, I'll put him in one. So. Uh, Eddie's been with him for, uh, for quite some time, Eddie and Connie Partridge. But, you know, Ryan Priest is, is a well-spoken young man. He's a good-looking kid. And uh, he, he is the perfect fit for racing at any level. So I just I want to wish uh, Ryan continued success on his uh, journey in this thing we call racing. Uh, just, again, I, I can remember a race that he thought he won, and, and I'm not sure if it was at Thompson or Stafford. I think it was Thompson, and uh, he was running second, and he got into Todd Zegedy, sending him into the infield. And, and I, when I heard it over the radio, he's not the winner. I'm going to put him back to, for aggressive driving. I felt bad for him. And when he went over to victory lane like he was going to go to victory lane they waved him away and somebody explained to him what happened and he went to his pit stall on pit road and he was just sitting there and i, and I walked over to him and and i said to him i said you know, ron you ran one heck of a race you're gonna have your day trust me all right somebody once told me you gotta lose one boy before you could win one that's the one he lost and he never put himself in that position again so uh you know good for him anyway the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup, again, was at New Hampshire, as we talked about. And Denny Hamlin was the winner there with Kyle Larson second. Martin Truex Jr. was third. Matt Kenseth was fourth. Kevin Harvick fifth. Daniel Suarez sixth. Clint Boyer seventh. Kurt Busch was eighth. Brad Keselowski was ninth. And Jimmy Johnson, uh, our seven-time cup champion, rounded out the top ten. Eric Amarola returned, as I said earlier in the broadcast, and uh, he, again, he finished 24th, last car in a lead lap. Little uh, cup news, Joe Gibbs Racing announced last week that Eric Jones would succeed Matt Kenseth in the number 20 car. This announcement was on hold, but Kenseth let the cat out of the bag while at Kansas, stating he would not return to Joe Gibbs Racing in 2018. Kenseth, who is 45, has been with Joe, uh, Joe, 
I'm sorry, with Joe Gibbs since 2013, and after 13 seasons with Roush Fenway Racing, Kenseth has 14 wins and 11 poles with Joe Gibbs. Look for Kenseth to move over to Hendrick Motorsports and jump in the seat vacated by Dale Earnhardt Jr. in the 88 car. Mark my words. Kyle Larson's qualifying time was disallowed as NASCAR found an unapproved rear deck on his car. They didn't find out what he went through pre-race tech? Come on. <laughs> You're kidding, right? Is, did they need to get Martin Truex that pole? Because they took the pole away from him. That's one of the things that upsets me with NASCAR because they let it go through originally. Now, unless, and I've been involved with these discussions, unless there was something questionable and, you know, you can't go right to the top guy. You have to go to this guy, then that guy, then that guy, that guy. And then that guy then calls upstairs to the big bosses and boom, there you go. We can't let him go with that trunk deck. I don't know. And in 22 figure eight, he says he lost 100 races before he won one. But that one, he'll never forget that one. You know, my publisher told me when I was trying to get my, published, my book published, he said, you know, it's not the number of no's you get. It's that one yes that matters. And uh, that one win, the first one is a big, I never experienced that as a driver. I don't have any regrets about that because I had, for the most part, a lot of fun driving, met a lot of good people, you know, but when my daughter was racing and I was racing and winning all those champ car races and a championship, you know, I, I, I got, you know, excited about it. And then when she, she won a heat race with, with a 20 year veteran pounding a bumper and she held on for that victory. So yeah, it's so good. I, I loved it, but you know, trying to get that win. But anyway, Kyle Busch, who led 95 laps at New Hampshire, um, and he won the second stage race. Uh, but a pair of pit road speeding penalties cost him big time as he finished 12th. Now the way they do it is in a trailer with TV monitors. I don't know, I don't know. Joey Logano, he arrived at New Hampshire trailing Matt Kenseth in, by seven points for the final playoff spot. And uh, now after New Hampshire, Logano was 52 points behind due to, yeah, due to uh, heading to the garage early in the event with damage. NASCAR also confiscated a rear suspension part from Logano's number two, which is an L1 level penalty. Logano, who was assessed an L1 penalty at Richmond, a race that Logano won, but was ruled an encumbered victory, which means the win is, was ineligible for playoff qualification. So Logano is no stranger to these, uh, these parts being taken away and points and fines. Um, I don't get it. I, I just, you know, some guys, they want to push that envelope. They want to push that envelope and they want to make it happen. You know, and as a crew chief, the crew chief's job is to get something by the officials. The official's job is to catch it. And I don't want to mean get something by, but just push the envelope. And no matter how far they push it, that official has to seal it. And, and, and it always reminds me back uh, in the day when, when one of the top running guys at Long Island, when I was the head, head chief here at the at the Riverhead Raceway, he always, he was more, his car was a little bit faster than everybody else's, turned a little bit better than everybody else's. Yeah, the guy did his homework, no question. But then it was one day I, I found, I didn't find it, my tech guys found an illegal park. The part was so illegal it wasn't funny. So, gotta bring the driver and the crew chief in my, in my office, so guys, listen, uh, I've got to take this one away from you. What do you mean? I says, well, my tech people said that you got this part, and that part's not legal. So the guy says, show it to me in the rule book. I said, you guys know the rule book better than me, but I'll show you. So I get the rule book out, and I, 
And I say to him right there, this part must be factory stock. Yours isn't. It's aftermarket. Guy, without blinking an eye, looks at the face and goes, so ours is legal. I said, how do you figure? He said, well, this part was made in a factory. And when I went to the store to get it, it was in stock. I said, no, that's not what that means. Well, no, but that's how I interpreted it. Yeah, but I'm the official, and my tech guy's the official, and so we determined that you're illegal. Well, no, you know, I'm going to appeal this, and I'm going to do this, and Bob, you know, okay, fine. We got to hold off the payoff in first place because he's going to do this appeal thing. Get, he, I call Jerry Cook, he calls Jerry Cook. We talk, go back and forth, legal, not legal. So Jerry Cook says to me, with all due respect, he says, all right, listen, let's give him this one. Rewrite the rule. Rewrite the rule. <laughs> uh, all parts. Uh, how did it go? I had to say something more. At the discretion of the official in charge. So now that gave, you know, yeah, you could have the perfect part, but if I don't like the way it looked, technically I could take you down. So, uh, you know, as a crew chief, it was his job to do that. It was his job to do that. It was his job to push that envelope. It was my job and my staff's job to, to close it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm, I wasn't a very technical back in those days. And I didn't know a lot about the building of race cars. The only thing I knew how to do was fix them because I wrecked so many doggone times. But, uh, and, but the success of any manager, they're as good as their people. And I had a couple of solid guys in tech that knew their job. I had one of the best handicappers, the late Bobby Copland, um, doing his job with, with help from, from his assistant. And he had many assistants over the years. You know, I, I, I had my people at the back gate. They took care of business. They did what they had to do, making sure everybody had their license and everything. I had people, I had a solid flagman. You know, I had the right people in place. And as long as you have the right people in place, you're good to go, and it's all going to work out. It's all going to work out. So anyway, we're going to take a break and wrap up after we come back. But when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the things that are going on with racing, not only at the weekly level, but also at the top levels when we come back. Hey guys, this is Jibs from Ocean's 8 Alaska and you're watching In Radio TV Network. Hey, I'm, I'm Raul Panther. And I'm Commander B. Hawkins. And I'm Mark Willie. We're uh, some of the proto men. If we see you without this bracelet, we are punching the d But if you have this bracelet from InRadio.com, you can win 100 bucks. Put one of these on or else. What's up guys? This is Assuming We Survive and you're watching in Radio TV Network. Welcome back. Yeah, it's funny uh, on break and, and I always say this, especially when I have live guests, but uh, during that break, uh, two th I was reminded of two things. One, it's not cheating until you get caught in reason. And two, these tracks that have a crate motor, show up whatever motor you want or when they bring you in the, in the office to talk to you. I said, hey, when I got it, it was in the crate anyway. 
Uh, I'll, I'll stick to talk of racing. But what I wanted to talk about, attendance, weekly short tracks, cup weekends. There's more empty seats than full seats. Why is that? I've been reading social media, some articles in racing newspapers, and, and it all comes up all the time. What's the problem? And, you know, sometimes it's the cost, the cost associated with, with going to your weekly short track with a family of three, four, five. You know, it's prohibitive. It's not something you can do every week. Um, and in some areas of the country, there's other options. There's other things. You know, kids today, you know, I'll go back. Back in my day when you are a kid, you, you could play Little League or conference football outside of school. Now there's soccer, there's lacrosse, there's dance, there's martial arts, there's this, there's that. Kids have options. They have options. The other thing is, is no new blood coming into the sport. When I say no new blood, you look at some of the weekly tracks, and I've been to dozens of them. It's second and third generation people that are racing and still involved. Or guys like me that are so old that climbing under cars now just isn't an option anymore. You know, there's no new blood. There's nothing bringing them in, you know? And, and 22 figure hit, hit the nail on the head. Uh, he, and he says, I think the next gener generation of fans aren't as into it as their parents were 20 years ago. No, he's right. You're not into it. When I walk around some of these short tracks, like I said, I've been to dozens of them. I see the same people in the same seats that they were in 30 years ago. They're just older. And as they move away, the place that don't have tracks or get too ill to be able to go or pass on, nobody's replacing them. Fathers aren't taking their sons and daughters to the race like they used to. Both parents are working just to pay the bills. You know, you go to your weekly short track, you know, it's a, whole, it's a buck and a quarter to get in and you gotta feed these guys. It's, it's, it's a problem, it needs to be looked at. Sanctioning bodies. Sanctioning bodies are making these the rules so it's not cost effective to go racing. It never really was. But when you think about it, you know, now you, you, you take a car, you, you, you got to get this motor, and because Joe Blow Engine Company down the road is getting 8,000 for his motor, and your guy, you know, you know, Acme motor, his guy won the championship, so he's going to charge more because one of his motors, and it just becomes a big snowball and the pricing for motors and parts go up. But the cost of purses that the tracks are paying out have gone down. Why is that? Rules, rule changes that just put drivers out of commission. There's drivers in the weekly racing series who have their cars and, and they're making it safe. They're going by that stuff, but then all of a sudden, Stop the, you got to get this new motor. Yeah, but the motor I have, no, oh, I don't care, you spend 30000 on that motor. You have to get this motor now. That guy's not doing it. He's not going to take a second mortgage out on his house again to get this new motor. You know, um, drivers in, in the top series, they hide from the fans. It used to be you knew who these guys were because they wore their sponsor logos. Forget the fire suit. They had nice slacks and they had ABC Corporation on their shirt or the hat, you knew who they were. And it was less TV, less social media, but you knew who they were. These guys today, they're, they're in their ripped jeans and a t-shirt and then they the hat on, because they don't want to interact with the fans. If it wasn't for the fans, they wouldn't be there. Too much TV. I never thought I would say that. When I was a kid growing up, you know, Wide World of Sports and ABC had, you know, racing in the wintertime, but they showed the beginning, the wrecks, some passes, and the end in a 45-minute show that also included alpine ski jumping or figure skating from Austria. So you didn't see the whole race. Now, 
there'll be hours of practice. People, they don't want to watch practice, you know? I guess they do because it's on, but it's stuff like that, you know? So at that level, there's too much coverage, and at a weekly level, there's little or no coverage, you know? Every locale has a local news channel. Every locale, no matter where you are, has a local news channel. What's wrong with our Monday morning? Hey, at, you know, Peconic Bay Speedway, Saturday night, the feature we're gonna was so-and-so. It takes 10 seconds. You don't see that. But God forbid a driver gets killed or severely injured at the weekly show. It's front page news and it's replayed over and over on the news and social media, only the negative, only the negative. Something needs to be done. When I looked at the stands in New Hampshire, not only for the modified race, but for the, for the cup race as well, and, and I went to a lot of cup races in New Hampshire, and I can remember trying to get down from the tower to get back into the infield so I can go sit in traffic to get out of there, it took forever. It took forever. I'm sure it doesn't take forever anymore. Somebody needs to take a look at this. What is happening to, and I'm gonna say our sport, what is happening? And, and one of the things that I say is happening is, is that nobody that's running the shows now in the top levels was ever down in the trenches as the late Walt Edsel used to say, they don't have any grease between their fingernails and their fingers. They sit in the boardroom and they make decisions based on who needs to be paid. And that's wrong. And, and I know it's a business and you gotta make money, but NASCAR as a whole shouldn't be making billions and billions of dollars and not trickling it down. TV coverages, product advertising, it's just, just not right. Yeah, anyway, uh, we're gonna wrap it up here and uh, just so you know, the, uh, the, the big boys are going to Indy this weekend, Eldora for the trucks on Wednesday night, and uh, it should be good. So wherever your endeavors will bring you this week, please be safe. Please be careful. Thanks for watching tonight. God bless you as well. Tell somebody you love them. Give them a hug, and we'll see you next Monday. Good night, everybody.